<clears throat> okay. Um, this is chapter 23, which is um, going to be a little break from our carbonyl chemistry to talk about the reactions of amines. So amines are molecules that have a nitrogen in them. And we'll start with a simple classification scheme of amines. Um, primary amines are when nitrogen has um, two hydrogens and one alkyl group. So when I'm going to talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary, I'm going to count the number of alkyl groups that are attached to the nitrogen. So if we have a nitrogen with two alkyl groups, that's a secondary amine. And we're going to have three alkyl groups is a tertiary amine and in each case the nitrogen has a lone pair so that's a tertiary amine and also we'll talk about this a little bit later on in this chapter if you have four alkyl groups attached to the nitrogen then you have what is called an ammonium basically it would be called an ammonium salt because what will happen is there's always a counter ion for that N plus, and so it, it might be a bromine or a chlorine or somehow a halide ion. So this is our classification system. We also have a nitrogen that is attached to a benzene ring, and that is called aniline. So we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of basicity here. But this is our basic classification of the different kinds of amines that we're going to use or talk about. Okay, so what I've done, let's talk a little bit about the basicity of amines, which is the beginning point of Chapter 23. And what I have is I've cut and pasted the chart here of um, pKa's of the conjugate acid, which... We'll need to need to correlate to basicity. So let's just start with something simple like if you have an amine when you react it with water you're going to form an ammonium and hydroxide. So this is the basicity equilibrium, Kb, and so we could think about this as being a pKb um, is minus the log of Kb. So we have to think completely opposite of the pKa or the acidity equilibrium. And this chart, unfortunately, says is showing the pKa of the conjugate acid. So that chart is to take this acid and react it with water to form the amine and H3O plus. So that, of course, is a Ka equilibrium. And so it's showing you minus the log of Ka. So we first of all have to figure out on this chart what's the most basic or I guess what's the least acidic here. So they've given this to you in terms of the equilibrium for the ammonium giving up its proton. Now if you think about that, that's kind of the reverse equilibrium of what we're talking about in the pKb equilibrium. So basically what would normally, in this equilibrium, what happens is, is that remember that the larger the Ka, the smaller the minus the log of Ka, or the smaller the pKa is. And remember there is an inverse relationship between pKa and pKb so as the equilibrium here gets 
stronger. In other words, if this is a stronger acid, the base becomes a weaker base and up here in our KB we would have minus the log of KB so in this case you would have the larger the KB the smaller the PKB so relating these two equilibria what our trend up here is going to be is that the larger the pKa the weaker the base okay. so when the pKb is when the pKa is so the smaller the pKa the stronger the base okay. i should have just given this chart as k as kb values but we'll go with what the book has all right so looking at this chart then we have let's start with the difference between primary and tertiary amines and what's the trend now i've cut the the um, paragraphs from the textbook and we'll go over it and we'll sort of um, unpack these so any oops, so any factor that increases the electron density on the nitrogen increases the basicity of the amine okay so looking at this equilibrium then anything that pushes electron density into the nitrogen will cause the amine to be a stronger base. Right. Let me rewrite that equilibrium so we can kind of make sense of that. Now, why would that be the case? Why would pushing electron density into the nitrogen make the amine more basic? Well, remember that when we've talked about in the past the equilibrium HA dissociating to H plus and A minus, the way we push this equilibrium to the right, but not using Le Chatelier's principle, but the way we can push this equilibrium to the right is to make A minus more stable. And if we make the conjugate base A minus more stable, the equilibrium will be pushed to the right and make its conjugate acid a stronger acid. Why is, for instance, a sulfonic acid a stronger acid than something like an alcohol because when I form the conjugate base of the sulfonic acid it's more stable because of and say it with me resonance resonance makes its conjugate base more stable and pushes the equilibrium to the right why would pushing electron why would an electron donating group pushing electron density into this positive nitrogen make it more stable and therefore push the equilibrium to the right well i got a positive charge and i'm pushing electron density into that ammonium so anything that makes the ammonium ion more stable and I don't want to withdraw electron density, I want to push it into the positive charge. That's going to make this more stable, and it's going to push the equilibrium 
to the right. So the statement that says anytime you increase the electron density of the nitrogen, you're going to make the amine more basic. Okay, so the next sentence says electron donating groups such as alkyl groups increase the basicity of the amine. All right, so let's write that equation over here. So when I make my ammonium and any alkyl group, remember the alkyl group, each of the carbons is slightly negative. That slightly negative carbon can push electron density into the, into the nitrogen of the ammonium and therefore make the amine more basic make a more basic amine by how by stabilizing the product by stabilizing the conjugate acid so what that means is that the trend should be more alkyl groups should correspond to a stronger base why because it's stabilizing that ammonium well there's a problem the problem is that when we look at the trend over here the trend is as we add alkyl groups we are basically making a weaker base as the pka of the conjugate acid goes up that makes a weaker base so we go from 10.64 10.99 and 10.76 so wait what is that what happened there well what happened is that the, the um, pKa of tertiary amine is smaller than the secondary amine, and the reason is solvent effects. Tertiary amines are typically less basic than secondary amines because increasing the number of... Now, does that mean I have this chart completely wrong? Uh, probably... I do have this chart completely wrong. Oopsie. Again, top shelf operation. I would have I would go back and re-record the video. I'm not going to. So if you were confused about this to begin with, you were correct. Um, the larger the pKa, the stronger the base. Sorry. So as we go from ethylamine, add another alkyl group, we get a stronger base. Add another group, we get a weaker base, because the number goes down. Okay. So tertiary means are less um, stable. Why is that? Well, because solvation plays a role. If you have an amine... Again, in equilibrium, water's going to... Water plus the amine makes the ammonium and hydroxide. The problem is as we get three alkyl groups around the nitrogen, these measurements are made in water, and so these three alkyl groups are going to end up decreasing the solubility, which means that water is going to less means water's going to stabilize this less. And so while a, ter while a third alkyl group would normally push electron density in towards the nitrogen, that's counterbalanced by the uh, decrease in stability of the, of the ammonium ion due to solvation by the water. So our trend for basicity is that secondary is the strongest and then tertiary 
and then primary. And that's shown by this stupid chart that says the primary is the less basic. Okay, so that's how we get our initial trend here of secondary, strongest base, then tertiary, and then primary. Um, the corollary to this is any factor that decreases the electron density on the nitrogen decreases the basicity of the amine. So now let's look at this aniline. Aniline is 4. So again, the larger the, the larger the pKa, the stronger the base. This is a much smaller pKa of the conjugate acid. And so aniline is barely basic. Why is that? Well, because when you have an aniline molecule, what happens is, is that the nitrogen, the lone pair on that nitrogen, is essentially being stabilized by the benzene ring. So in other words, if I kind of try and write a flat benzene ring here with all of the p orbitals around it, that lone pair on the nitrogen would look like this. And so that lone pair can be part of, partially part of the conjugated system. And so therefore it would lead to that lone pair being less available to bond the H+. Plus. Now, it still can bond H+, plus, um, but it's going to be less likely to. Another thing you could say is, well, can't I, write can't I write my resonance structures like I did in the case of the um, electrophilic aromatic substitution? And the answer is yes. So this has a resonance structure that would look like this, with the nitrogen having a positive charge and then having the negative charge around the ring. Um, those resonance structures then are leaving this nitrogen with a slightly positive charge, and therefore that nitrogen is going to be even less likely to bond to hydrogen because it's going to have a slight positive charge, positive proton, Positive nitrogen, not a good um, combination. So anilines are going to be very weak. Very weak bases, as shown by the chart. So the fact that it's at 4 means that it's a very, very weak base. Now... Again, any factor that decreases the electron density decreases the basicity. If you attach groups onto an aniline, if I attach a group, so let me write that equilibrium out. What types of groups do you think, going back to electrophilic aromatic substitution, what types of groups do you think will make this amine a stronger base? You can look at the paragraph above. That would tell you. But let's just think about what can I do to stabilize the, the ammonium product of this equilibrium and therefore push the equilibrium to the right. Should I have an electron donating group or should I have an electron withdrawing group? If you said electron donating group, you're correct. Because what I want is I want the electron donating group 
that's going to push electron density into the ring and cause that stabilization of that N+. plus. Do I want to withdraw electron density? No. Because if I do that, I'm going to be withdrawing electron density when the nitrogen would really like some. So any factor that decreases the electron density on the nitrogen, like adding an electron and withdrawing group to a benzene ring, is going to decrease the basicity of the amine. If we look at this table, nitro is what kind of group? It's electron withdrawing, therefore it's pushing or pulling electron density out of the ring. Notice it's P the pKa of its conjugate acid. I hate that. I just should have put pKbs in this table. Um, that's going to decrease it, so this is going to be a, a weaker base than aniline. Okay, so if I want a stronger base, push electron density into the ring with an electron donating group. That will cause the ammonium or the aniline to become more basic. And you can see that down here. So in other words, adding a nitrogen gets me the biggest number. Adding electron withdrawing groups gets me the smallest number. So that means this is a stronger base. This is a weaker base. I know there's a lot of different trends, but we need to talk about this to kind of uh, think about ways to push or pull electron density. So it's best if we push electron density, that's going to make a stronger amine. Okay, now let's talk about synthesizing amines. So the first way to synthesize an amine is just to do alkylation. And we're going to do that in subsequent reactions. So think about this. Let's say I have something like ammonia. And I react ammonia with a primary alkyl halide. Now, night in the periodic table, we go CNOF. Remember that basicity increases as we go from right to left. That also means that the nucleophilicity increases. So nitrogen is a much stronger nucleophile. This is a stronger nucleophile than an oxygen. So water would normally not do this reaction, but an amine will, right? Water or alcohol plus a primary alkyl halide. Remember from our chart was no reaction. With an amine, it will react. So the nitrogen will come in, attack the carbon, and kick off the halogen. So we're going to do an SN2 reaction. What that means is that I'm going to have the nitrogen with its three hydrogens attached, so I'm going to form an ammonium. And then what happened to the halide? Well, the halide is the counter ion to that ammonium, so I make what's called an ammonium salt. Now, at this point, I'd be done. You could say, well, let's take that amine and let's react it with another alkyl halide. Yeah, the nitrogen right now has a positive charge. It's not a nucleophile. So what should I do? Well, let's add some hydroxide to this, and the hydroxide will deprotonate one of the hydrogens off the amine, and so therefore I can make the free amine. I'm going to call this a free amine, and we're going to form water and we're going to form water from that reaction. Now with that free amine, it's a nucleophile, so then I could react it with let's say another alkyl halide. So now that amine will come down, it'll add, it'll kick off the halogen, 
I'll do a second SN2 reaction. And now I can add a second alkyl group to my amine. Again, I'll end up with ammonium with another halide counter ion. Well, I'm going to take another sodium hydroxide here. The hydroxide to come over and deprotonate the amine, the ammonium. So now I'm back to my, now I'm at a secondary amine. I can repeat that process now and add a third alkyl halide. The amine will come over, kick off the halogen. And now I can put a third alkyl group on the amine. It's, no, it's an ammonium. Again, that halide becomes the counter ion to that. So I would need to react that with another hydroxide to make basically my tertiary amine. Now you might say, could I react another one? Eh, sure. We could react another alkyl halide And that would put a fourth alkyl group on the ring, making an ammonium salt. But at this at this point, I can't turn that nitrogen neutral because it's now an ammonium. So we usually so we usually end up stopping here. So I can start with ammonia, and I can put whatever alkyl groups on the ring or on the nitrogen to make either the primary amine or the secondary amine, or the tertiary amine. And we'll do that later on. So that's one method that we can use. And this would be called, since I'm adding an alkyl group to the nitrogen, this would be called an alkylation reaction. Now, reductive amination is a little bit different. And I'm going to go to a um, blank slide here. So reductive amination is going to require we do the following. I'm going to take something like a secondary amine and react it with a carbonyl. Now remember that the in this case I have a secondary amine. So it's going to come in. It's going to attack the carbonyl. A pair of electrons is going to go there um, initially. I'm going to add the nitrogen with its two R groups and its H, so it forms an ammonium. Then we form, we have the um, O minus. Remember, this is a zwitterion. If it's a zwitterion, then that means that the O minus will basically deprotonate the nitrogen so that I'll end up with a. what I call a hemiaminal. I think the book um, calls us probably like a hydroxylamine or something like that. Um, so then what happens is then if we treat this with H+, plus, the oxygen will get protonated. Probably is going to require a little bit of heat for this as well. And what happens next? We lose the water. We would normally end up with this carbocation, but then this pair of electrons from the nitrogen will be able to form the probably the more stable resonance structure which would have 
the positive charge on the nitrogen. Okay. Now, I know this is a little different than forming the enamine like we did before. And the reason for that is because we're going to treat this hydroxylamine not necessarily with heat, but we're going to add acid and heat to it. And that's going to end up forming this compound. Now, the whole idea here is that the next step, we're going to add an H- minus to this reaction so that what can happen is the H- minus can come in and attack the nitrogen. The pair of electrons goes to the carbon so that we add the H here. The carbon then becomes negatively charged, which then is going to pick up a proton, that C minus is then going to react with some type of proton. Maybe we just dump water in, but the C minus will then deprotonate so that what I'm going to end up forming is I'm going to end up forming the amine. And what I just did was I started with this amine up here. I just added this chunk, that group to the nitrogen, and where did that group come from? It came from a carbonyl. Now, this step, the H minus step, is a reduction. And usually, I mean, you could, on paper, you could say, well, let's use sodium borohydride, let's use lithium aluminum hydride. Um, the reagent that's typically used is a kind of a derivative of that. We go NaBH3. Oh, where did the fourth H- minus go? It's not there. We've replaced it with a CN, with a uh, nitri with a cyano group. So this is typically the reducing reagent that's used to provide the H- minus to do this to do this reduction. So basically the purpose of this ex of this series is to add a group, that group originally coming from the carbonyl to the nitrogen to make a new kind of an amine. So this is what's called reductive amination. Okay, so it's a little different than when we formed the enamine, although I will show you that we could actually um, use the enamine or the imine or the shift base to do this reaction in um, a couple minutes. Okay. All right, so that is the reductive amination synthesis. Okay, so we have alkylation and reductive amination. What's our goal here? Our goal is to add alkyl groups to the nitrogen. That's our goal. That's our synthesis. Now, the Gabriel synthesis is one of the classic methods of forming primary amines. And the way the Gabriel synthesis works is that we're going to take this molecule And this is called potassium thalamide. Where have you seen that structure before, or at least part of it? Without the benzene ring and a bromine on the nitrogen, this is N. BS. This is n bromo 6 -sentiment. So what we typically use is potassium thalamide, so we just add a benzene ring to the five-membered ring. We deprotonate the nitrogen to make an anion. I can react this with any primary alkyl halide so that the nitrogen comes in, kicks off the halogen, and what I end up doing is I end up adding that thalamide group 
to the nitrogen or to the alkyl group. So this primary alkyl group is now attached to that nitrogen. This is an amide, which means that it is a carboxylic acid derivative. And in the next chapter, what we're going to find is that if you take any carboxylic acid derivative and you treat it with either acid and water or base and water, and I'll talk about the base and water because that's the best method here, this reaction is called hydrolysis. Hydrolysis meaning cleavage by water. So this amide is going to be converted to the primary amine and then what happens to the thalamide? Uh, the thalamide ends up as basically like 2 carboxylate 2 carboxylates. And we'll talk more about that reaction in the next chapter. But the critical part is I basically free the nitrogen from the ring and I can form any primary amine I want using this Gabriel synthesis. We prefer, we prefer using the hydroxide for this step. And I'll, and I'll show you why. Um, back in the day... I wanted to convert this 1,2-dibromoethane um, molecule into ethylene diamine. And, but it wasn't just a normal ethylene diamine molecule. It was an ethylene diam a diamine molecule where the nitrogens weren't nitrogen 14 they were isotopically enriched to nitrogen 15 so we could do some NMR on it. Well in order to do this reaction what we did was we ended up purchasing the potassium thalamide that they had enriched in, potass in nitrogen 15. Nitrogen 15 is only typically about um, 0.1 or 0.01 percent. It's a very low percentage of natural abundance nitrogen. Most of it is nitrogen 14. We needed the nitrogen 15 to do NMR. So if we purchased some N15 enriched to, I think this was like 99 percent enriched, then if we did this reaction, we could convert both bromines into nitrogens using this Gabriel synthesis. And this thing was a pain in the you-know-what. And the reason why it was a pain is because this is a diamine that is incredibly soluble in water. Incredibly soluble in water. Why is that? Any amine is incredibly soluble in water. Why? Because when it reacts with water, when, it, when it's in water, it forms the ammonium salt, and the ammonium salt is ionic, therefore very soluble in water. So the amount of free amine that you have in water is pretty, pretty um, weak. And or it's pretty low. So even if we put two of these groups on the end of the CH2, um, we were actually okay with that step. It was getting the ethylene diamine molecule out of the water that was incredibly difficult to do. So what you do is, if I do this, if I make the solution basic, what am I doing? When I make the solution basic, I am increasing the concentration of hydroxide. Le Chatelier's principle says that I should then push the equilibrium towards the formation of the free amine, which either will form a second layer that I can just pull out with a pipette, or I could extract it much more easily with something like diethyl ether. 
So when we did this reaction, our biggest issue was getting the ethylene diamine out of water. The way we did that was we hydrolyzed our, um, our thalamide molecule in basic conditions so that we would basically push the formation of the free amine. And it worked. Eventually what we did was we put two methyl groups onto each of the nitrogens. So we put four methyl groups on there and we used that nitrogen 15 compound as a ligand to study how it would interact with a lithium-6. So back in the day we published a paper on it. Um, but the synthesis was actually done by an undergraduate student, a very good undergraduate student. Um, and it was kind of started by a um, one of my fellow postdocs when I left Brown and unfortunately somebody left the step out in the synthesis so we had to figure out exactly what she had what she had kind of left out um, and back in the day you left a key element out that was obvious to everybody so that they had a harder time re replicating your synthesis but nowadays you can't do that so the idea is that if you want to get an amine out of water, number one, you're going to have to work really hard. But number two, you need to do that on, with base because it will push the equilibrium back towards the free amine that you can then extract. So that's, the, that's how we use the Gabriel synthesis to make this molecule. And we were like the first people to make that molecule, which was interesting and exciting. Um... So that's that's one way to make a primary amine. Another way to make primary amines is to use SN2 reactions using either azide or cyanide. Let's deal with cyanide first. So let's say I take my primary alkyl halide and I react it with cyanide. Cyanide is C. Triple bond N. Strong nucleophile comes in, kicks off the halogen. We form... A, what's called a nitrile right if your if your polymer the nitrile gloves that everybody's you know wearing around now um, those are those have a C triple bond N in the polymer that makes up the nitrile so if we make this nitrile then to convert this to a primary amine all we have to do is then react it with something like lithium aluminum hydride. And so I reduce the triple bond here all the way down to the carbon nitrogen bond that I make my um, primary amine. Now notice that the alkyl halide I started with picks up an additional carbon and the NH2 in the synthesis. Um, so this lithium aluminum hydride is again a source of minus of the minus charge and we'll come back to that if we have time. If not, we'll talk about that mechanism in the next step because we can actually understand that mechanism if we understand it means or shift bases. But well, I can do the same thing if I take my primary um, alkyl halide and re I react it with this molecule. This molecule is called azide. So azide has nitrogen um, double bonds, and then one of the two of the nitrogens are negative, and the one's positive. So overall, it's got a negative charge. What happens is that azide comes in, kicks off the halogen, so that I now add the azide molecule to the nitrogen. So it would look like this. Okay. And again, the halogen is, at this point, the halogen's gone because I don't have a nitrogen with a positive charge. Now, let's think about the charges here. The charges, this would still be a positive charge. That would be a negative, so we're neutral 
overall. There is a resonance structure for this. We could take this pair of electrons, move it here, and then move that pair of electrons out to the nitrogen. So that nitrogen would have a negative charge and now the positive charge would be on that nitrogen, on the center nitrogen. It's resonance stabilized. Now, again, with this, with this molecule, with this alkyl azide, if we treat this with lithium aluminum hydride, a source of N minus, sorry, not N minus, H minus, I can end up losing that group. So I end up losing nitrogen gas. And I'm going to end up with the nitrogen that's attached to the carbon as, again, a primary amine. So this is another way for us to make primary amines basically by doing SN2 mechanisms. Okay. Now, both of these mechanisms, since I only have four minutes left, I'm, I'm going to hold off and we'll start with these mechanisms in the, next, um, in the next video. We'll go over, because we need to really talk about um, some minor points here, but it's the reactions that we're going to do are going to set up some of the reactions that we're going to do in the next chapter. Okay, so we'll hold off on that for the moment. Um, in a couple minutes, in the couple minutes I have, enamine and shift base formation. This is review. But just to remind you, uh, no, that's not what I wanted. I don't want a benzene ring. I want a carbonyl. So if I treat that cyclohexanone with a secondary amine, if I treat that cyclohexanone ketone with a primary amine, what am I going to make? In the case of the primary amine, I'm going to make the shift base. And in the case of the secondary amine, I'm going to make the enamine. Now for both of these molecules, if I wanted to, I can reduce these to the amines. So this is kind of a reductive amination in a way. Um, the only question is, what kinds of reagents would I use to do these reductions? And we'll, we'll again talk about this in the next video, but how about I just say this? Let's use something like hydrogen and palladium and add two hydrogens across each of the double bonds. That would be a way to do the reduction. You might say, can you use something like a lithium aluminum hydride to do the reduction? Yes. Do we need to talk about that mechanism? 
yeah, we need to talk about that mechanism. And we'll couple talking about that mechanism with how we reduce the nitrile and the azide into forming those primary amines. And we'll do that in the next video. Okay. So this is uh, the first few sections of chapter 23. And um, the, in the next video, we'll start from here and talk about the mechanisms in gory detail as a way to review some of our other reactions. Okay. So that's the end of this video, and we will pick it up from here in the next one.